Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Cold Hard Truth Podcast. I'm Jack Smith. I'm Shrikar Rajendran. And I'm Anish Gupta. We hope you guys had a happy holidays, a Merry Christmas, whatever you celebrated. We hope it was a good one, uh, but we got to break down NFL football. Week uh, 16 was, it was a really good week. There were some ups, there were some downs, and now we're going into week 17, not the last week of the year like it has been in previous seasons, uh, the last week of fantasy championships though for most people uh and the second to last week in the nfl so there's a lot of great things to talk about don't really want to you know wait on that let's let's get right into it how was your guys's football weekend uh and then we can get into some of our takeaways football weekend was pretty good uh i couldn't i couldn't really you know like watch as much i was kind of around the house a little bit but uh i was able to watch the pain that was the 49ers titans game uh, I, I have too many words on that game. I have too many words about Jimmy Garoppolo that I won't get into now, but Niners can adjust. It, it was just not a very good game on all sides. So yeah, it, it was an okay football week on Sunday, but Thursday was pretty much, you know, a low point. First off, I cannot wait. I'm really hoping that Houston beats San Francisco so that I don't have to hear all these Niner fans tell me, that, oh, my God, did you see Trey Lance win? Oh, my God, this guy's the future. I don't. I'm really hoping, Houston, please step up. Uh, as for my football weekend, let's just say Christmas started off really good. Um, you know, I got a little Wentz sign helmet here. Uh, love it. And then uh, it didn't really end well. Um I had to watch two of the worst Browns losses I may have ever seen in the span of five days. Like I, I'm telling you, with 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 this team, especially with Baker Manning, it it's it's not even the it's not even the fact that like we lose. It's just how how we lose six one score games in in games decided by six points or less. You guys know what our record is? It's zero oh and six, zero oh and six. I I don't I don't I don't know how that's even possible, but it is. And it was that loss really stung because you guys all know there were a couple missed calls that, you know, should have been um, despite a horrible performance kind of, you know, all around from offense. But yeah, so that kind of ended the football weekend on a bad term. But, you know, hey, there's still a little bit of hope. My friend removed his little curse that he had on my team. So two more weeks. Let's see where we go from there. Always remain hopeful. There's always half full, you know, glass half full. And I'll pass it on to Jack. I'm kind of like back and forth on those calls, to be honest, because especially okay, the last come one. Come on now, really? really? On the last nah, the, the like, missed DPI was. Come on. See, here's the thing. And the though, first one, awful. the first one, he's pulling him past five yards for like 10 yards. No, are you talking? I assume you're also talking about the last one, like on the last interception. Yeah. That's first the one I'm like, if you know, because if, if you're going to let wide receivers like kind of body into a DB right out of their route, like, I feel like DBs can have a little bit of leeway holding on if, if you go I mean, right into no, them. But, okay. But if it's, I think there was a clear tug, right? Clear, clear like contact. And then also, like, right. Wide receivers seen, get to do that all the time. They clear, no, no, but, yeah, but right they do the it different, but they, because the rule for them is you can't extend. Right. So like, you'll see like a B and like D hop, right? Like if they're going on a deep route or like anything past 10 yards, they'll kind of lean in. Right. And then kind of rub off. It's not like a push because, the, cause that way. Right. They're pushing, they're kind of moving the DB a little bit away from the ball. You know what I mean? That's if they're moving like, their body this way and they shift. If that's... you rub off instead of pushing, that's kind of the same as like tugging as opposed to pulling. Like, I feel I like agree, it goes both I, ways. I, like, thought, I thought there was a clear like, because I, I feel like, you know, nine times out of 10, they're going to throw that. I feel like nine times out of 10. Okay, fine. Even that. if they throw the flag, are you confident Baker's finishing that game with a W? Yes, because they would have oh, listen oh, listen. been they would have been, been at the 40 yard line, they would have been at the opposing 40 with 54 seconds and three timeouts. Come on. Yes. I and they think Baker's Baker was I, I think I think they would have ran the ball after that. If they had gotten that first down, they would have ran the ball. Well, you got to keep in mind, Baker was doing everything he could to make sure the Packers won and not the Browns. Let's okay, but let's be real. I know this isn't a Browns takeaway or anything, but let's be real. In the second half, he did convert a lot of third downs that were needed. They were seven of twelve on third down. He did convert a lot of ones that were needed. Yeah, he just um, threw. But yeah, he just saw threw. picks only on first. Still awful. Literally, he literally had like seven incompletions, and four of them were picks. Like that. I mean, you know, it is what it is. Um, enough about them. Jack can you know go into it on how. Yeah, uh, the Jets. Like, contrary to what you guys said, I actually had you know was allowed to have one, you know a better football weekend this weekend than uh than most. Uh, the Jets won. Rookies really showed out, which is kind of like. 
starting on this back half of the season, all I've really cared about is like, if the rookies play well, you know, that's, that's good enough for me. Wilson had that, that, that long touchdown run. He's been playing better, more conservative, but better over the last couple of weeks. Uh, Michael Carter's a stud uh, and they've had some good rookie performances from DBs and one in fantasy two, one in pick. So yeah, pretty good football weekend, especially coming, uh, you know, Christmas weekend as well. Um, but if you guys are ready to get in my takeaway, I wasn't exactly sure how to word this and I feel like I'm kind of a week too late. Um, but I really think that teams need to start trusting their analytics. And I'm kind of like the takeaway is I guess that the mainstream media is wrong about, you know, analytical decisions, fourth down decisions, going for two at the end of games, kind of that whole hodgepodge of things that have been happening over the last three or four weeks. Um, that's gotten a lot of criticism from, you know, the main talk show hosts, like focusing and I guess on the, three things the chargers fourth down decisions the ravens two point decisions and then like one example i want to talk about was the bills which I'll, I'll get to in a little bit but i really i don't know how to word it but there is not a problem with the decisions that like brandon staley and harbaugh have been making when it comes to fourth down decisions and two point conversions i'm pretty sure you guys agree with me on this but like the chargers went for it five times against the chiefs on fourth down and while it didn't work like there weren't a there wasn't a problem with the decisions like each of the times when whether you want to talk about like opposing drive success rate expected points added like any of the analytical terms that these teams look at they were the right decisions and while they did lose the game because they didn't execute them like I just feel like you cannot go blame the decisions and I think like one of the funny things is you see all these all these hosts blaming them after losing the Chiefs but where were these people after they the Chargers you know went for it on fourth down in their own territory multiple times and beat the Browns like they were praising uh Staley's aggressiveness and confidence in his team and it's like I just think this whole this whole idea is a mess, um, but the problem is not with the decisions. Like I can get into more of the specifics after like you guys give your opinions, but that's just kind of what I was thinking as my takeaway. I'm not sure how to word it, um, but I, there's definitely not a problem with these decisions. I think I think you're right. I think there's a time and place for you know analytics in the sport. If a coach becomes too obsessed and analytics driven then I think we kind of see some problems. But in the case of Staley, in the case of Harbaugh, I agree. I think, I think they were the right decisions. They just couldn't execute. That's all it really was. And I think the actual play design when it comes to Harbaugh's fourth down call, um, especially in that Packers game, it just wasn't that great because everyone, everyone knew it was going to go to Mark Andrews and Packers sniffed it out and they made a great play. So I think they were the right decisions. But when it comes to execution, when it comes to play design, yeah, I don't think it was that good. And I think the mainstream media, especially the news cycle this year, it's been it's been really weird because Jack, you're right, as you said, they're kind of they kind of flip-flop between what they want to praise and what they want to criticize. And it never, it's never consistent. Like it's never even. So I, I agree with you there. I think I think it's just very weird how the news cycle is working this year. But I mean, it, it's kind of how it is every year. And I think it's gonna be that way in the future as well. But I, I think if you get too obsessed with analytics, it can hurt you. But in terms of what Staley and Harbaugh are doing, I think they did the right thing. So, I mean, obviously, I don't know if you guys all know this, but this is like a little bit more my field considering this is my major. And um, ironic, or and the quick touch on Shrikar's point, yeah, the media will praise what works and they will criticize what yeah. doesn't. Uh, I think that's how it works. But Just don't let your mind get actually, corrupted by that. As I, mean, I don't think I ever told Jack this. My friend actually made an article on uh, Brandon Staley's fourth down thing and made a whole general thing about it. And I actually have it pulled up. So like a couple of things she wanted to mention was just, you know, fourth percentage differences and like, you know, fourth down attempts per game difference from last year. And pretty much every team has gone up. There have been a couple that have gone down, for example, Cardinals in New England by like almost a, like a half attempt per game. So, you know, like eight or nine, if you, you know, average that out to the season. Um, but, you know, again, all signs have kind of pointed towards more fourth down attempts happening, right? And you're seeing the percentages, they are going up. They simply are just because, you know, there is better play calling for those specific downs, right? There's more, you know, uh, how do I say this? There's more preparation for it. Rather than, you know, if you're kind of thrusted in with like a fourth and two, right? And the coach is thinking to themselves, oh, what do I do? What do I do? And they see like another team going for it, right? This is kind of back then when things weren't really planned for this. The game has become so much more technology driven. You see guys like, you know, Amazon making these deals where, you know, they will throw, they will literally have their Surface tablets filled with these stats in the game so that they will look at it mid game and analyze it. So, you know, 
technology is only increasing with, you know, a combination of football. We already know with the helmets and stuff. So, you know, this is going to be more of a tech driven league. Uh, I'm really hoping that replays get better too. And they really look at that and they focus on reviews, but in terms of fourth downs, again, I, I think it's only going to go up and I am all for it just because, you know, it is, you know, it does contribute to the game a little bit more. And I also think that anically, anically, analytically driven teams I'm always in favor of I've already told you guys about this right analytically you know run uh, zone schemes to the you know zone reads and uh, run kind of play calling it it has worked for the last two years right I think I've mentioned certain teams Pats Packers Rams Vikings uh, the Niners did it like in 2019 those were the teams that did it and all of them finished with a running record so and all of them had pretty strong run games albeit with you know some of them didn't have the best running backs but uh, in terms of overall four down attempts, as Jack was mentioning, and just the analytics in general, I'm all for it. I'm all for the change. Um, I don't know what re it really means to be too analytical. I just, I, I don't think any yeah. of us can really say that. So I like, you know, as much as it, I kind of have been studying it for the last, what, half year, I don't even know what that means. Like, I, I just can't really tell you what too analytically based, you know, a system would be. But I would say, you know, a lot of these guys, if you're looking like the new coaches, they have some pretty strong, uh, you know, educational background. Like, again, we ha I always point to our, you know, tandem of Barry and Stefanski, who are both Ivy League guys. And you're seeing it a little bit more. There's a trend, you know, guys who have, you know, a, a proper education and certain stuff like this. Like Stefanski was an anal uh, head on analytics background, too. And so did Barry. So they I mean, obviously, they pride themselves on an analytically run scheme. So. I feel like that's just going to be a more part of the game and fourth down attempts will come with that. And uh, I think that's great for the game. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of my touch on it. I think, and in terms of the media, right again, like Josh converting and not converting against the Titans. Yes. That's, you know, people will say, okay, what the hell, you know, you could have just kind of played your cards a little bit better or the two point attempts. But I think the word, the best part about it is, is that football players will always be on your side if you go for it. I feel like they will they will always be in favor of that rather than being conservative because then they'll think that they don't the coach doesn't have faith in them. So that's kind of my touch on it. Yeah, really well said. And I mean, you're right because you never really see players complaining about going for it, but you think back to the Packers last year, it's like the, exactly what's going to happen if you don't go for it. Um, yeah. And I think I, I agree with your point that like, I don't really understand what being too analytically driven is because like if you, the, these teams only decide to go for it when the math says go for it and, you know, when the percentage is on their side. So like is too analytically driven doing that yeah. every single time just, when the math is on your side. I feel like that's the yeah, right way to do things. Agreed. Like sometimes it's also common sense though. You don't need. Yeah, to I, don't, I don't know. Like, see, cause I don't know how many times, you know, cause their sheet is pretty, how do I say this? It has various metrics on it, yeah. right? They're like call sheets. So I, I don't, I actually don't even know what everything is on there. Um, I know, I do know they have certain stats pulled up from previous things that, yeah. you know, they can use and they pull, they have a bunch of stuff available. I mean, they have surface tablets they, they can use whenever. So it's not like they're like, you know, out in the open or out in the cold without any source of, you know, info that they can use. And obviously they've got the guys up in the booth that are looking at stuff, you know, simultaneously. I just don't, I just don't know if how much, you know, certain coaches use percentages and say, okay, just because of that, we're going to do it. But I mean, you, they see it, they see, they get all these things back. Like uh, I've seen a couple of guys who have like, you know, a couple of guys who know scouts that are just like, you know, they have all the percentages with them and they, they get everything on a week to week basis. So, you know, it's just a matter of how much you use it versus, you know, if you're an old school guy and say, okay, you know, let's just look at film and really break down this, you know, certain coverages, or, you know, if they look at say, Hey, you know, our quarterback was, you know, over 30%, you know, downfield or something like that on throws, right. 20 plus yards downfield. I think it's, there's so many metrics nowadays. And then I think that's what it uses, but I mean, how much, you know, again, do they use that as the driving point of their, you know, offensive or defensive scheme? I think that's and maybe what you could say is too. It, it's, it's common sense. And, uh, especially for the Harbaugh, for the Harbaugh situation, he actually left the decision up to the players. Uh, I saw them mic'd up for it. It wasn't even his decision. He said, he told Tyler Huntley, do you want to go for it? And he kept saying yes. So sometimes it can actually just come down to the players. Most of the time it is analytics, but I think, I think that was, I think that was kind of a yes anyway. Like he, yeah. I think he knew that, like he knows they're going to say, he wasn't yeah. going to say no, but I mean, you yeah. think back, remember, remember their game against the chiefs. They made the ex almost the exact same decision going for it on fourth down. Exactly. He said, Lamar, Wait, and they, they went to Lamar. Mm -hmm. I think, so I think, I feel like that's a coaching trick. Like, I feel like yeah, he's no, getting definitely. his players amped up for it, right? Like, like he's like, all right, because because as a player, right? And if I'm asked, like, this is week two, right? If, if I'm Lamar, right? And Coach Harbaugh is telling me, like, hey, do you want to? I'm going to be like, hell yeah, right? Like, 
I'm, I'm gonna be like, yeah, let's do it. Cause I want the ball in my hands if I'm the star quarterback. Right. So yeah. I feel like that's, I think that's just a coaching tactic and you know, it works and it doesn't yeah. work. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised. Harbaugh, Harbaugh's a player's coach anyways. Yeah, absolutely. So if he has that trick up his sleeve, I think he's always going to use it. I think also we should look rather not at the attempts, but rather at the execution of the play. Exactly. Like, and, and that's, that's something I wanted that's, to talk about too, because like you could talk about the chargers execution, but how about the fact that like Herbert threw a touchdown and it only, or, uh, I think it was the first time they went for it. They were fourth, that fourth and goal. And Donald Parham just unfortunately, you know, hit his head on the turf and it was knocked unconscious and dropped the ball. Right. Like, it's a right decision and you and I want to focus on that one specifically because you know these teams look at their fourth down conversion rate the other team's drive success rate uh, which I don't want to fully get into you can look it up uh, online and figure that one out but if you're down at fourth and goal the drive success rate changes based on the difference so they know the Chargers know that they I think they were like second in the league at that point in fourth down conversion rate the expected points added like it's 50 it was like i think 50 50 on whether they score a touchdown so expected points on average is about three and a half if you kick the field goal which isn't if, you, if you're a chargers fan you know isn't a guarantee either that's expected points of like a little bit under three so like the the math is there and you make the decision and plus you know that now you're going to make patrick mahomes drive almost 96 yards i think it was down the field and while the chiefs do have like a high drive success rate it's much lower from their own four yard line than it is from the 25 so like the math was there uh, i think they made a good decision the execution was an, on that specific play uh, i think it was there um, yeah, just I- an, an unfortunate end to that play and some of the other ones like yeah they didn't execute all that well but like you can't just go out and then after that happens, say, Oh, just take the points because like the math is uh, there. Right. I think, the I think every, every, up. every fourth down play kind of boils down to that. Right. Like yeah. you could boil it down to those two t- statistics, or you can boil it down to other ones. Right. Like yep. fourth down percentage difference from last week, or, you know, there's so many, there's so many metrics for each and everything related to the football now, right. You, you see it. There's so many analytics guys in all of sports and yep. who knows, maybe I'll be that one day. But I mean, like what I'm saying is like, I think also good execution can override any type of decision. Yeah. I think that's also what people should look for. And you know, maybe, you know, we can all agree that maybe the going for two against Pittsburgh was a good decision for Baltimore. It was just a tad bit of a poor execution because yeah. the receiver they never made the wrong team. decision. No, that's, that's, that, that is exactly what I'm trying to say, decision. I guess, with my takeaway is I don't think I can look at any one of these. If you call it, call them eight decisions, you've got the Chargers going for it five times. And you got the Ravens three games in a row, kind of like staking their chances on second or on two point calls. Like, I feel like there's nothing wrong with any eight of those we can talk about you know at the end of the half the one that a lot of people hate on for the Chargers. At the end of the half they do the same thing go for it on fourth yeah. and goal they say just take three points the chiefs aren't going to get the ball back anyway but expected points three and a half to a little bit under three like the math is there you just got to convert you look at the the ravens going for it this week people praise them when they went for they went for or they went for it on fourth down to keep the ball out of mahomes hands because they were sure he would go down and win it how about this time? They were going to give the ball back to Aaron Rodgers with with a tie. Like, I don't know. And even yeah. if he doesn't get it, then you're going to overtime and you have to stop him again. Like, I don't know. I, I don't. I, I yeah, have, especially I like, again, and they're looking at they're looking at numbers, too. Right. Like yep. against Pittsburgh. Right. Depleted secondary. Right. So you're throwing yep. in, you know, four to have go play. Right. A team that had scored 17 points in the fourth quarter. Right. Yep. You get there's so many things that come to end to one decision, and I guarantee you, if you are a head football coach, right, which we are not, they are definitely looking at that stuff. Like we cannot fully say, you know, oh, you know, Staley wasn't thinking about this, or Harbaugh wasn't thinking about that. He just asked the players, like, no, he's definitely think they get time, they get a little bit of time. Obviously, they would like more, but they get. Well, some they've got they've got guys in each ear just spewing out information at them, saying this is what the math says. You know, mm-hmm. oh, look, look on the Steeler sideline. They're tired. Like, you know, you have a depleted secondary. Like, there's all these, like, there's, thoughts coursing exactly, through your head. Right? That's and why I, this is a collective group, right? Yeah. It's not one guy making the decision. There's a whole coaching staff. And, yes, those guys are – they look pretty irrelevant just walking on the sideline, but they do have some impact. So, yeah, I think that's a good end to that takeaway. Should yeah, definitely. Want to get into yours? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. My takeaway is that right now – we are seeing a very, very, very sharp contrast between the top two teams in the NFC West with the Rams. They're getting hot at the right time, and the Cardinals are actually becoming cold at the wrong time. And if we look back, initially the Rams were the favorite, um, while the Cardinals were seen as that you know up-and-coming team, could be good you know, sometime later. But then the Rams faltered uh, in these middle months, 
And the Cardinals won despite injuries to Kyler Murray, DeAndre Hopkins. And now we're back to the Rams being the favorite. So it's weird how that kind of changed. Um, the Rams beat the Vikings. The Cardinals lost a third straight game earlier on Saturday. And now the Rams are ahead of Arizona. There's two games left and the Cardinals have to travel to Dallas to play a red hot Cowboys team. So have fun with that. But for the Rams, I think there's a lot to be excited about. Matthew Stafford, I have to, he was terrible against the Vikings. He had three interceptions, but still that game, you know, it was never in doubt. And this team has been reeling for weeks and, you know, all the COVID issues they had to deal with too, but they're peaking at the right time. And I was kind of thinking about it earlier in the season. I said that Sean McVay's teams, they have this trend where they falter down the stretch right now. We are seeing them picking it up down the stretch. So it kind of bucks that trend in a way. Um, and should the Rams win out, they'll at worst be the three seed, I believe, um, which means they're guaranteed of a home game in the wild card, potentially another down the line. So I think it's interesting how we saw that contrast throughout the year and how this division kind of changed with each passing week. Yeah, I remember we, I think us three got into a, like a debate about McVay faltering at the end. And yes, I know I love defending him. I love Sean McVay a lot. Um, he's probably one of my favorite coaches, if not for Kevin Stefanski. So, I mean, look, I think the Rams quote unquote falter, right? It was the Titans, the Niners and the Packers. And I think those were three games that they, that there was a reasonable argument for them to lose like all three. And yes, they were seven and one. Right. And I feel like, you know, with a young system, right. And I think when they started to get hot was right after Thanksgiving and with a new QB, right. Who's still learning the system and a kind of a, you know, not really new personnel, but just new players kind of coming in. Right. And especially with all the COVID stuff, right. To get hot at this time. I mean, this is one of the most dangerous teams in the conference. And I think, you know, with games to go, right. Like, and as you mentioned, Shrieker in the Vikings game where Stafford wasn't playing well, what did Sean McVay do? He ran heavily, right. He leaned on the run game. He created some great openings. I thought he called a tremendous game in terms of running the football and Sony Michelle went off. Right. And now you have, Michelle and Henderson, who have shown they can both be productive in this system, right? And now Cam Akers is supposedly going to come back. How? I, mean, I don't. Yeah, I don't know what they're gonna. I don't know what they're gonna do with that. I, I'm not gonna speak on it just because I really want to see how it works. Well, Henderson's but, out, so I mean, there's yeah. definitely a spot for Akers. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just, I would want to keep Michelle in, right? He's a young guy. Yeah. He's. This is only his fourth year. I feel like he should just keep going, but you know, they do what they want. I. If, if there's anyone in football that I trust, it's that it's Sean McVay. And I will ne- like, I will almost, I will almost never question what he does. Um, but yeah, so they've got two games left, right? They got the Ravens and the Niners and two winning teams. And um, I think, you know, if they do win out, right. Uh, I did, I ran like 50 playoff scenarios, obviously my, you know, trying to find some way the Browns can just, <laughs> and you're right, Trico. I think they, they can go, go up as high as the two. Um, I mean, you know, if the Packers lose out, even if, even if the Packers lose out, I don't think they can get the one. So they can go as high as the two. Um, but I think for the Rams right now, they just got to focus on really just getting, I feel like getting more acclimated with all the new players that they've kind of gotten. Because think about it, they've kind of had to go up and down with the roster, especially on offense throughout the last three weeks with COVID. So I think they just got to find some stability. And, you know, I think one of the better positive things about the virus, obviously having experience, once you get it, it's very hard to get it again. Cause you, you know, develop the end. So it's kind of yeah. good. And, you know, knowing at least those guys got it at that time and they're probably doing better now, right. If they're vaccinated, it helps with the symptoms. So I'm hoping that, you know, for them, it could be better. And then for the Cardinals, you know, quick touch on them again, this is, I, you know, how much, how long, you know, Jack, I'm going to ask you this too. How long can we really say they're a year away? Like how long can we really keep saying that? Because I, I just don't know when to stop with that narrative. Right. They've, you know, we, I, I thought you and I agreed on a consensus. They were your way last year. Right. And it was looking good. You know, we were saying that and now, you know, they started off what, uh, you know, seven and oh, and then 10 and two, and now they've faltered and lost three straight. I, I just don't know when to stop saying that, oh, you know, we just got to wait for the right moment because I know they have some injuries and they're going to still make the playoffs. So, you know, maybe they ought to just kind of, you know, sit a couple starters and just kind of, you know, run in, or if they really want to get a crack at this division, I just don't know where Arizona goes at this point. I, I'm kind of confused on the final two weeks. I just think they got to reset stuff when it comes, you know, week 19, which is the wild card round. That's, you know, my yeah, opinion. I'm definitely not going to say they're a year away this year. Like they, they don't get that treatment anymore. Like there's exactly. certain teams that I might say that for like the Chargers, like the Bengals, the, the Cardinals do not get that treatment anymore. And I think 
the funny thing is ever since we started to have that conversation about McVay and his second, his teams, you know, faltering over second half of the year, which you still can't argue with the past. It's happened in the past this year. That's exactly, you know, what the, the Cardinals have doing have been doing. And I saw a graphic and I just pulled it up back right now. Since he, since he joined the Cardinals, Cliff is in the first half uh, of seasons, games one through seven, I believe that's 12, 15, five and one. And in the second half, he is, uh, that's three, six, eight, eight and 18 as Cardinals head coach, like in the second half of the season. And if you go back to his time at Texas Tech too, where he was also a head coach, his total numbers, games one through seven, 42, 20 and one, and rest of the year, 16 and 43. Like, that is absolutely terrible. Um, That's a I think, weird trend. I mean, you know, like it's hard to explain that. No, I feel it like is. it's hard. It's hard to really define. What... I think it's. It's. I think it's a, a lot of it boils down to scheme. I mean, you. You. If you sell out to try and win games one through seven, you're going to show a lot of stuff, uh, and you have to be able to adjust. Like, good teams are able to go out and win games. Great teams can adjust to win games. And right now, like Cliff Kingsbury has not proved that yet. I think. One of the takes I had preseason that had kind of been coming back to bite me in the butt was that Cliff Kingsbury was, you know, on the hot seat and I could really see him getting fired after this year. I feel like that's kind of come around a little bit more on my side as of late. Like, I don't know how much you can trust Cliff Kingsbury because there's a like a given track record of doing this. And like we saw what they could be weeks one through seven. And now we've seen kind of, I think, a little bit more of what they are. I feel like it's somewhere in the middle. You know, they're not a team that's always going to go out and get blown out by the Lions, but I don't think under Cliff they're going to be that, you know, 7 and 0 like winning the division every single year kind of team. And so when you're the Cardinals and his contracts up this year, you kind of got to start, you know, weighing uh your options whether he is going to be the head coach or not. And I, as of right now, I don't think I can give you a solid answer of what I would want. Um but for the Cardinals, I think it's it's really interesting. You're right in East. They're still going to make the playoffs, but what that means for them, I, I still don't quite know. I had my reservations about Agreed, this team yeah. coming into the season. Their first round exit. Yeah. I mean, well, here's what do you like? What do you like? What do you say about you know a team that it's it's so tough because even at the start, right? We never feared them. I don't think anyone really feared this team. I, I like. I, I don't think that's. True. I think everyone was saying, okay, we got to no. keep them in our top two for the rent. But like for me, I never thought that this. I never saw enough to where I was like, oh, okay, this team really could. When, when they it's were seven, no, yeah. I was kind of starting to be like, oh, maybe I was yeah. wrong about this team. Like, it's, I, not, I it's still, not even I feel about, like, yeah. So, narratives, I feel like start there, but I, I think my thing was right. You know, we've seen teams start off like five and oh, right, and yeah. flat out fall off a cliff. I've seen this, right, but this is times. seven and oh, like, and yeah, they, they yeah. were looking pretty dominant. Like I said, it, when I had them as my takeaway, they were undefeated on the road and had won every mm-hmm. game by over 10 points. Yeah, like, so I just I never, I, I don't know. I feel like with Cliff, I just never feared. I think maybe that's maybe one thing you can kind of look at at Cliff, right? I just, I don't know. I think this might've been just me. I, I always recognize them as, you know, a top five power, you know, power ranking team. I just thought that, you know, come playoff time. Now, I think a lot of people thought this maybe because of the inexperience, right? If you go up against a guy like, you know, Aaron Rodgers or Tom Brady, or even the Rams in the playoffs, I just, I just didn't, I just couldn't see myself picking Arizona no matter the trend I just could not I I feel like that could have been just me um but you know it's it's not saying this team is bad because they've had so many great moments this year and look they've been getting hit with the injury bug throughout the year it's just been pretty subtle right JJ Watt kind of went out for the year Chandler Jones been up and down in the lineup right um even uh, they got a couple guys in the secondary out with COVID and then now obviously offensively, right. Kyler had the, I forget if it was the shoulders. He had something, uh, mm-hmm. some, some injury for that lat can hampered him for like three, four weeks. And then same, obviously D hop has been out, you know, out of the picture for like literally six of the last eight. So um, I, I just don't know, you know, what I can expect from Arizona in the playoffs. I think the worst part, and I think one of the things that kind of gave me a telling tale was in the fourth quarter against the Colts, right? They're up, they're, they're still up, they're in it. And they kind of just broke down mm-hmm. and, you know, in, let let them go down 70 yards and score a touchdown. And then obviously JT kind of iced it. So I... And it's something you we, you say you don't know what to expect in the playoffs from them, but it's just something that I've held since the beginning of the year, no matter how well they finished, I just wouldn't trust Kyler and Cliff in a playoff scenario. They just don't, don't have experience in that, in that, you know, in that spot. So even if they were at home, if they're on the road, even worse. But I think 
they're just too young. They're just yep. too young. And so I think, yeah, the pro I think the only way they really could have done something is if they were in State Farm State or Glendale, wherever, whatever it's called. Yeah. Maybe. Which is funny because they've been better on the road. But like yeah, because I mean, you know, as much as we say that now, I feel like you know, you do not want to play cold. No. Over that you no, especially you don't. that team. No way. No way do you want to play in that scenario. The only one who's like real, maybe the only guys who are really experienced at that is like AJ Green and Zach Ertz. That, that's like literally it on their offensive team. So I, I wouldn't want to, you know, I guess we can kind of wrap it up and say, you know, the two trends, we both acknowledge it. And I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm kind of excited to see where they go in the playoffs because it's a whole new ball game. Yeah, I didn't get to talk about the Rams much. I still have my reservations on them. I'm going to say that for like playoff time because I don't fully trust Matthew Stafford, but that's a, a story for another day. To kind of wrap it up on the Cardinals, I feel like they're exactly where I expected them to be at this point in the season. It's just a, a different path than I expected to get there. All right. So my takeaway getting into it, uh, it's actually it's ironic because Jack was going to kind of talk about this, but then he made it into a whole generic thing with like all AFC QBs. But I'm going to take it from him. I'm going to do the Burrow Her- Herbert takeaway. <laughs> and you guys know like how much I love Joe Burrow. And I'm going to say this. I don't think there's that far of a gap. I think the gap that people are trying to make it out to be is a lot less than it really is. And I think I've been saying that for the last year now. Um, I, I just, and I, I still think to this day that the Bengals were right in taking Burrow number one. I still think it, I will still believe it uh, until like there's substantial evidence that I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm going to stick with that. Maybe that's also part of the takeaway. Look, I, and it's not even because he threw for 500 against, you know, a depleted Raven secondary, right? It's just because of what he's done throughout the year. I mean, this was a team, again, I just looked at a graphic. The team was literally like, you know, 5% chance to make the playoffs. And now they're sitting at 79%. I mean, the, and it's literally because of this dude who hadn't had, who only had 10 starts coming into the year or not even, sorry, eight start coming into the year and who put up, you know, some of the, if you put his first 16 games among any quarterback in, you know, NFL history, it stacks up pretty well. And I think this, you know, Joe Burrow has really shown us that this Bengals team has such a bright future. I mean, I I think people have already mentioned the graphic, but I'm going to mention it anyway. They've got a 4,000 yard passer, a 1,000 yard rusher and two 1,000 yard receivers all under the age of 26. I mean, this is, if I'm a Bengals fan, which honestly, I wish I was right now. I am, I'm ecstatic because this, this team is in such great hands and it's such a great future. And I know that this is a winning culture because they all buy in. I mean, like, you know, watch their Instagram lives after they win a game or, you know, watch how they pick each other up or even just, you know, the slightest things where like, they're not mad if the chase got one catch for three yards and I didn't hear a peep out of him. And uh, I, I forget which game, but it was a pretty important one. And I literally didn't hear a peep out of him like this. this I, if I wish I was a Bengals fan right now, because I'm in love with what they're, what they're building. And it's, it's all thanks to, you know, number nine. And this is no knock on Justin Herbert. I think all three of us can agree that this guy is, you know, kind of cemented himself in that top five to seven range. And then, you know, as I see you guys not, I think this is, I think this is in consensus, right? And even with Joe Burrow, I think we're all in agreement that this is one of those guys that is already in that top 10 range, creeping on those top eight. And uh, someone asked me to make a top 20 list of quarterbacks, like off the rip at like 1 a.m. And I was doing it and I was like, okay, there's like eight quarterbacks right now that no one can really dispute are the eight. Those are like kind of the elite class, you know? And I told these two guys, what I love doing is I don't like really talking about those eight because those are the guys that, you know, everyone knows are good. I love talking about those guys that are in that 15 to even 20 or 10 to 15 range that I feel like could go in that eight, right? We've seen guys like Josh Allen do it, right? And Justin Herbert did it this year. Who's going to be that next one, right? And some guys maybe come out of it and maybe, you know, you can think can come back in, right? Like Lamar or Wentz or even, you know, Joe Burrow, right? A guy who I think, and I think all three of us are potentially thinking could slide himself in that range because I like, I think eight is a really good number of a tier one, you know, elite class of quarterbacks. Who are your eight? Like, I want to know the eight. Oh, oh, uh, I I don't want to, I don't know if I should go in order, but I'll try. Uh, Rogers, Mahomes, Brady, Allen, Herbert, uh, Kyler, Dak, uh, Stafford. I think those are the eight right now that I can confidently say I would take if I were starting a team. Those were the eight. I think I'd go seven. I like. I, I think maybe you leave Stafford off that yeah. list just for now. Interesting. Okay. I and, think. I mean, yeah. Maybe that could be just for the season. Maybe that eight. But you know, I think it changes every year, right? Like, if you're going just for the season, I feel like Burrow eight, makes it nine. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, that's what I'm saying. Like, I if think it's just for I think season. if I were to put Herbert and Burrow, I think they're only a difference of maybe three. Like, I think Burrow's right out of it. I, I honestly wouldn't even mind putting him in it for this year. Like, they, I mean, you know, forget the PFF numbers who grade him number one and he's got like the highest grade, whatever. I mean, you know, that's all Cincinnati awesome based that. uh, company. Huh? It's, the- it's awesome to see it. I love bragging about it. But, you know, just, I mean, if you watch this guy play, right? I, I think. You know, and he gets the ball down the field and yes, he will make his mistakes. You know, Brett Favre did it, but he, I don't know. There's something about him that just gives me hope week in and week out. And for Justin Herbert, you know, as good as he is, and he is great. There are some games where he just has stragglers, right? Last year, the Pats game this year, the Texans game, that is a, that is a, that is a blemish. And I'm not hearing anyone talk about it. That's a have top five heard? loss on the season by anyone. Like yeah, a like worst we- loss. Have we heard? We the Cardinals were slandered. Kyler was slandered for like a whole week for losing to line. I haven't heard one thing by the media about the Texans beating to, one. I, maybe I'm blocked or deaf. I don't know. Well, I, haven't I haven't seen it either. Anything. No, I haven't I, seen. And, yeah, th- it was a bad game. Look at the picks that he threw. They were bad interceptions. They here's, especially here's the one to end the game. The pick six. That was a bad pick. And I'm not hearing really. At, but when Joe Burrow lost to Chicago, right? Those three picks, which two of them weren't even his fault. I I didn't hear the end of it. I heard, you know, his old line's not going to help him. This guy can't do anything. Well, that was him. also in week two. Sure. And everyone mm-hmm. was overreacting at that point. Agreed. But I think, you know, just I feel like we need to – it's not even a knock on Herbert, but I just think people need to recognize that Joe is not far behind. And I think these guys are way closer than people think. And if I'm Cincinnati, I am perfectly content with this guy – you know, with picking this guy number one and going forward with him for the next five years. And again, I think he's the best quarterback in the AFC North for the next five years. And I don't even think it's particularly close. And here's the thing. If we're talking just 2021, I'd listen to an argument for Burrow over Herbert, like genuinely. And here's the thing with Herbert. He's an amazing quarterback. You can't lose to the Texans in week 16 with everything on the line. That might keep them out of the playoffs. No, so. Yeah, because conference percentage, right? Win percentage. Right. That's, and He's amazing, but yeah. it just can't happen. And quarterback, I know we don't really count quarterback wins as a real stat, but you know, someone I, here does. I I, do. I, I, I will I, always I do it. Cares. I will always do it. So, yes. You I got, you got to factor that in at some point. And for Joe Burrow, he's just out of his mind. He's playing out of his mind on Sunday. Uh, the fourth most yards in a game ever, 525. And one win, and you get the AFC North title. The Ravens were just <laughs> outmatched. The Ravens were just outmatched in that game. It, it, yeah. Burrow was just throwing at will, having his way. So I don't think the gap is all that big. I'd listen to an argument over Burrow uh, for Burrow over Herbert for 2021. And I think overall, they're not that far behind too. And in recent weeks, I was saying Burrow is great. Herbert is elite. I still think it's that way, but I think Burrow is slowly just kind of creeping into that elite, you know, territory. And maybe next year he's going to get there. Wait, quick, Jack, before you go, because I want yeah. you to answer this and kind of get into your thing. Because, uh, you know, you obviously watched Herbert a little bit more in college than I did being a Pac-12 guy. I feel like he had the same thing. He would be great. And there would be those games where he would just kind of falter, right? I, I believe mm-hmm. it was the Auburn game where he just... He didn't step up. I can't remember which ones, but he had like some stragglers. So I'll let you kind of. I for, I I like to forget a lot about Ber- or Herbert in college, just because I mean the staff that he was playing for, like that offense was not tailored to him at all, and like that's why he was able to kind of fly under there. That's why a lot of people were like, "Oh, this this guy's a bust." It's just because like Oregon did not put him in a position to do well, and the Chargers have like so I like to forget about him in college. But I guess you're right. Like he had a little bit of that volatility, and I feel like it's a little bit more up and down with Herbert than it is with Burrow. So like. Good point, if you yeah. want to say, you know, he's a little bit more flashy or he, he's uh, like, I think he has more talent than Burrow. And, and I feel like Burrow's a little bit more refined. So take that as you will. Streaker, I think you're coming of like Herbert is elite and Burrow is great. Like, I feel like you kind of have to, I, I agreed with that a couple of weeks ago. Right now I'd say Bur- or like Her- Herbert is at the top of like the great slash elite category. And Burrow is kind of like, fair a little bit more towards the great side herbert's a little bit more towards the elite side but it's it's closer like i agree with anish it's closer than i think we thought uh, a couple weeks ago um and coming into the season like we all wanted to believe in burrow but there were obviously questions like there was the acl there was the offensive line but he has overcome almost every obstacle thrown his way so far how. in the nfl like yeah. the one thing where i think he really solidifies himself as one of the best quarterbacks in the nfl and, and above herbert like his pedigree like his ability to go out and win his toughness like i don't think there is I don't think I can name 
He's gritty. Three or four more tough quarterbacks in the NFL. Yeah. He's, yeah, he's gritty. I think that's the perfect word for it. He goes out. He wins on Sunday. I think Herbert has more talent. He's got the better arm. He can make more throws uh, than Burrow can. But like at this point, you're you're picking between apples and oranges. Like they are they are both absolutely fantastic. Whether you want the one who's who's got the big rocket arm or the winning pedigree, like I, I think they're both fantastic. Uh, both probably at the end of the season when I'm going into next season, going to be ranked inside the top ten. Um, and at, at this point, you're kind of, you're like, you're just pulling hairs. Like, who are you, who are you going for? And I actually kind of want to ask you and each a couple of those questions. Like, can I give you a list of quarterbacks? And like, you say you want Burrow. It more oh, let's than do them. it. Yes. Yes. Right, going into next year or like right now? Like, I think if, if you were just going to make like going into next year, making your quarterback rankings, okay. like who, who would yeah. you have about like, so Kyler. No, really? I'd put Burrow over Kyler. I, I would. Too. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then I, agree. I would too. I would too. Uh, Dak. I would take Burrow. Yeah. You take Burrow. Mm-hmm. Lamar. Oh, Burrow. Okay, sure. good. I, I, yeah. Like that's a, a couple weeks no ago. Problem. That was more of a question. Like I think I yeah. texted you about it. Like a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I, I remember. And I said I said it wasn't as far. I was like, okay, this guy's creeping up. And I think now it's you know again it's a tale of two trends as Shrikar was mentioning with the Rams and Cardinals, right? One's going it's kind of going like this, and now they're meeting right here. And I think one, you know, mm-hmm. um, but I will. I mean, Shrikar, as you mentioned, honestly. If, you know, gun to my head, I would make the argument about Burrow being better than Her- uh, Herbert this year. I could. I could right. easily make that. I feel like, I, I, I mean, I would probably be one of those that would lead the charge on that. Um, but as, you know, again, to touch on, you guys are literally describing what I love about QBs, right? Gritty, yep. winning predator. You guys all know this. I always talk about it, right? I, I, I'm seeing so, it's so weird, but I'm seeing similarities Again, with Josh Allen, I've told these guys a little bit that it's not the arm strength or even just, you know, the problems with accuracy. It's just it's just the winning pedigree that I thought both of them, you know, have shown in their first couple of years. And I think, you know, Herbert, again, he will wow you with, you know, certain plays where it's just you're right, Jack. He is more talented. Again, Burrow was a third string quarterback till his junior year. So it's not like this guy was a I don't even I think he was a three star recruit. I Like he was never he was never, you know, at, like asked to be, you know, great. Whereas Herbert kind of came in. Right. And was a really talented guy. I, I don't remember if he uh, was a redshirt freshman, but um, I knew he had the keys to it. You know, a lot of the offense and for Burrow, again, had to work his way up. And I feel like that's what makes a lot of these quarterbacks so great. Right. Brady, you know, um, who else? Patrick Mahomes. Right. Guys that were never, you know expected to be this and kind of work for it and I I just love that about Joe Burrow and every time I see him on the press conference every single time he's like we're it's not enough yet we're still hungry and I I cannot tell you how you know how lucky Cincinnati is to have a guy like that a guy who is never satisfied in every interview he says he always says hey job is not you know not the Kobe like specifics but you know in a similar mindset right it's like okay we're not done with this yet like even when they were in the AFC North he's like okay, so we have seven wins. What, what does that matter? Like he's, he's always fighting for that next step. And he's such a confident guy. Like, man, I hate the fact that I have to root for him against him two times a year because man, I really like this guy. They're, they're Rogers and Breeze. I don't know what to tell you that Rogers and Breeze, Herbert, Herbert and Burrow, Rogers and Breeze. I don't know. I can't, I don't know. I would, I would, you're maybe. talking about winning pedigree, grittiness, uh, Breeze accuracy, Breeze. great, great poise and really presence in press conferences. Pedigree. He's Drew Brees. I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna irk you a little bit with that one, but uh, I, it's, it's not a bad combo. I feel like I could find a better one. And give me time, I will find one. I, will find I, one. I think Joe Burrow has become what I wanted Sam Darnold to be. Like, I think they have, like, <laughs> they, they have some similar traits. Like, they, they, they weren't the highest. They weren't the highest level recruits. Yeah. They both can sit down at a press conference and, and, you know, say those words. Like, I feel like Darnold said okay. them and Burrow can really act on them. Like he's okay. just, he's, he's what I wanted Sam Darnold to be, you know, just like that. that I wouldn't, I wouldn't fault you in wanting like, for that. I wouldn't fault you for wanting in that. No, so, I don't. you know, but let's, you guys want to move on. I feel like that's a good I, I will say he is starting this week, you know, you know, could, could upset the saints. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Oh, Sorry, I sent you. I sent you that graphic, and I just, I just wanted you to react to it. I just want, I just wondered what you would say. No, I don't. If I don't they say do, if they anymore, somehow do, I keep my lips sealed. Okay, good. Yeah, because you know, it's okay. It's okay. It's Jack. like it's We're like here. you and the Browns. You know, I just can't have too much hope. It's so hard not to have hope, dude. I, I feel you. It's okay. Not, it's not as hard for me anymore. 
It, it's so hard for me. All right. You guys want to move on to fantasy? Let's do it. Yeah, let's hit it. Uh, whether you guys are in your first week uh, of two or one of one for fantasy, it's probably your championship this week. We hope that we were able to help you guys make it. Um, we hope you guys made it. If you did, like, let us know in the comments section. Uh, we can totally help you out with more start sit decisions or, you know, help see your lineup uh, and let you know what we think. But it is the championship, so we want to give you some of our best start sit advice of the year. Last week, or we had, you know, I think a pretty fantastic week, and hoping to build on that this week. Does anyone want to start uh, with their fantasy starts? Or oh, I'll start. All right, uh, my start this week is going to be Christian Kirk against the the Dallas Cowboys. And I think this is just you know a volume play because he's been getting a lot more targets, especially with DeAndre Hopkins out. My only cause for concern with this is Trayvon Trayvon Diggs is going to be on him, but Diggs is prone to giving up yards, and I think. Kirk can, you know, get those yards. So I think Kyler is going to be looking to him early and often. And I think he'd be a good play, um, you know, as a volume pick. They don't tend to shadow either. So like Diggs yeah. doesn't tend to shadow, so they yeah, can move Kirk yeah. over. Like, I don't think it's going to be Diggs on Kirk 100% of the game. Mm-hmm. It's and you so show me to go? Or you want to go? Yeah, you want to, you want to, you want to go? Yeah, I'll go. Uh, my fantasy start is uh, NFC off or offensive rookie of the month. Someone oh had a hot God. take on him coming oh into the season. God. He'd lead all Lions receivers and receptions and yards and he's kind of uh, exceeded those expectations a little bit that's I'm talking about Amon Ross St. Brown obviously uh, you know former USC Trojan one of my guys from the draft this year I'm, I'm so excited to see him playing well but he has morphed into like an actual fantasy threat uh, double digits in four straight over 23 points in three of those four uh, he's at double digit targets in four straight games uh, over eight catches in four straight like He's setting Lions records. He's tying with Calvin Johnson and Jalen Waddles crept into that mix too. It's like really good company to be in. Uh, and I think you really have to start Amon Ross St. Brown in your lineup. He goes against Seattle who, you know, they're not a great defense, uh, but they do slow the game down a little bit. So it's like, I feel like that kind of evens itself out, but I'm trusting Amon Ra. I'm in one championship out of my four leagues and I'm trusting Amon Ra as in my flex uh, over guys like Michael Pittman, uh, Odell Beckham Jr., Devonta Freeman, Deontay Foreman, a lot of those guys. So I, I, I'm believing in Amon Ra. Hopefully he goes over 23 again. I think that would be just absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I remember, again, I think I've talked about it a couple of times, but Jack and I raved about the pick. As much as I know he went to USC, but whatever. Like, we love You pick. never raved. Come on now. Yeah, we did. We loved it. Pick 113, round four. Come on. You, you find me the deal. receipts, but we I'm not giving that credit him, for raving about it. Him and Carter. Him. I loved him and Carter. I remember we were, both, we were both happy about those two picks in round four. Happy, not raved. I'll give you <laughs> happy. Mean, I guess, yeah, because he did go to USC. But um, I, I thanks for the 26 points last week, Amon yep. Um, My start is going to be KJ Osborne. Uh, you know, he's been pretty productive without Thielen in lineup in the two games that he was absent. Oh, I know it sucks. Thielen's not going to be on the field for the rest of the year. But, you know, Vikings weren't making the playoffs anyway. Um, but, yeah, I think KJ is going to have a, a pretty good week. Uh, and also, I think a guy who's not – like – I mean, kind of a must start, but like, if you have him do it, Rashad Penny, like, you know, this is a guy that was kind of a bust and has really kind of, you know, broken out. So, and he's going up against Detroit. That was just another guy that I wanted to throw out there, you know, even over like, if you had like a guy that you would think to kind of, you know, start, uh, you know, they're like at flex, like maybe like Cordero Patterson or something, which I guess is kind of translating into my sit if you guys are okay with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my sit would be kind of two Falcons that I would just be cautious of. And if only if you can't like have to, right? You would, uh, is Cordero and, uh, Russell Gage again, you know, as much as Patterson has been awesome to watch this year and, you know, what a great story. Um, again, it's a tough matchup and he's been kind of slipping in, you know, these tougher games that the Falcons have had to play. Right. I think he's been under 10 points, uh, in three straight games, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so I think, you know, be a little bit cautious with Buffalo. They, I think one thing that we can all agree on with Buffalo is that they beat up on bad teams and their point differential in those games is insane. Yep. Uh, they have like a plus 160 point differential. That's like almost unheard of uh, at this point in the season. So, you know, that's like winning a game by almost 10 points. So, you know, just be cautious of those two guys. Uh, and then also a quick note on uh, Trevon Diggs. He did the same thing again last week. He got a pick and then he gave up like a 50 yard play. To, I think it was, Cam Sims? I, I I don't remember. I think it was one of those. I forget who, but yeah, like it was literally the same thing that happened in the Pats game, happened in the Washington game. I just, This guy's so confusing to me. I, I just don't know where you rank him, Uh, but yeah, maybe transition to that. I just, I don't know what to do with him. Yeah, because you see the picks and then picks are just so misleading for cornerbacks. So, but they're so my, game changing at the same they time. Are, actually. Like, they Especially are, when you have but it, it won't matter if you give a big chunk, a big chunk play on the next play. So yeah. My sit this week is going to be Saquon Barkley against Chicago. I, is Saquon becoming an auto sit now? It's just 
Yeah. They I, he's I, had one touchdown in the past five games. When they're at the goal line, they don't give him the ball. That was a receiving one in garbage time, too, my dad. Sounds like Trevor Lawrence at running back. One touchdown yeah, in the last eight games. Okay. Really? Tre- tre- Are you yep. serious? Yeah. Oh my God. But know. it's just awful for Saquon right now. And, you know, maybe next year we'll see something a little bit better. But uh, I, I got to doubt it at this point, Not knowing the him. trend of running backs. So Saquon's going to be my sit. And, and I don't really see him doing all that much as he has in recent weeks. Yeah, probably a fantasy award for like most disappointing pick of the season, but there's you could have seen up, it coming. There are some like I, I avoided Saquon in just about every draft because you just don't know with him. I think it, it's just a tale of like something where we're just really sad to see fail. Um, but it's just at this point, you can't trust him. And I, I don't think you can trust him in future years either. Just way too many injuries. And it, it's really unfortunate because probably the most talented running back in the league i'd say when he's healthy um so it's unfortunate but i think yeah you gotta sit him this week uh i'm also gonna sit chuba hubbard who's taking over for maybe the second most talented back in the league in in a uh, christian mccaffrey uh but chuba I'd hubbard I, think, he's first, but I would say he's first uh, i don't know that's just me you know you know how i love i know i know I, yeah so. I, I mean i just think take one's more talented not better but more talented uh chuba hubbard while like i think a lot of people still want to play him because he's starting running back in carolina that does not mean as much recently. Uh, he hasn't gone for double digit points since week eight. Like that is nine weeks or yeah, eight weeks of fantasy football and has not gone over 10 points uh, since then. And he faces New Orleans who I would say as of right now is probably playing like the best defense in the NFL. So a uh, recipe for disaster, do not start Chuba Hubbard if you want to win a fantasy championship. Um, but if you have been starting him, it, it kind of seems like it's probably tough for him to get you to a fantasy championship. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's been brutal like and, and people no, still like, play him that's the i thing genuinely I don't think the panthers have been playing like the worst team in football i like over the last few i i i they've think been, they have. like they've they've got off literally they've become unpickable i i the cannot see scenarios terrible. in which they win games like, the jags i'd say i think i still said the jags i don't know if i feel like if they were to play i would actually take jacksonville i like i'm not even kidding i like they've been playing so bad as not with sam Darnold healthy now though and starting. oh my god stop it okay but oh wow I mean, sam Darnold's gonna fantasy, beat the jags. Right? Like, maybe advice for next year if you guys didn't make it dude never pick players with question marks like literally i i feel like they always go wrong always like i took Le'Veon bell with the second pick when he held out and what did he do he didn't play the entire year like ne- i feel like if there's something that was going stupid on with them, what were you doing i i thought i thought he was gonna come back i i didn't know he was gonna actually pull through with it i mean hey worst decision of his career but i don't you know yeah that cut that totally sank him yeah um, but you know what like and also like injury concerns just don't i feel like like i know a guy who literally like traded saquon and like like a good receiver and like for a month for jt back in early in the season because he was like he doesn't want to deal with the questions of saquon like he just doesn't and I, so, um, you know i just what a I agree that was. With don't don't take players that that you know there's something around them because almost always it ends up bad like, that's my advice i guess i'm so haunted by a trade i made earlier this year and it was like it was a totally like in the moment i think like it was week four Jonathan Taylor had not really gotten the oh, ball no. in, in the first three games. Like you he remember had injuries that. on the O-line, dude. Wentz was no, no, hurt. No, 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 no. It wasn't that. They weren't giving him opportunities. That was the weird nah, part. It was yeah. like they weren't going to him. And I had and I had a uh, I had Taylor and I was offered a healthy David Montgomery and a healthy Adam Thielen. David Montgomery, who had been a wi- or running back one in like his last 10 fantasy weeks. And, and I accepted that because I'm like, this is perfect value. And then of course. They give the ball like 30 times a game to Jonathan Taylor. David Montgomery goes down and Adam Thielen goes down. Hey, it's okay. You you got Adam Thielen. No, I flipped around and traded him for Calvin Ridley. <laughs> <laughs> so, and still ended up like being the two seed in that league. That, that's on you point. for trading Thielen. Don't I ever had, I had Calvin more. Ridley in three or four fantasy leagues. So yeah, I did too. Like, Don't worry. I, I did too. Don't worry. I Who literally knows? had my four of my five best players that I drafted in a 14-man league get hurt or – on the NFL reserve li- COVID-19 list. No, no, no. Uh, Ridley's not, on, he's on the like NFL yeah. personal reserve. I don't even yeah, know what it's yeah. called. Like, I think it's the NFL R like they have a. Yeah. 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 Okay. No, I had a, yeah, that league. I mean, I had JK Dobbins. I had Calvin Ridley. Uh, it, it was brutal, Raheem but Mostert, that's fantasy football Edwards. for you, right? That's Most fantasy football, love, man. It's, yeah. it's, it's brutal, but you're in the championship hopefully this week. And then hopefully we give you a chance to win it. Speaking about the championship, you guys ready to get into picks? Let's get into it. We're two weeks away from crowning the, the eventual winner, Shrikar Rajendran, uh, as our picks leader. But 
still got to pick uh, games for the next couple of weeks. So let's get right into it. We got five games on the slate this week. Uh, they're important. Um, I'm not sure how much variance I think we're going to have, but I guess we'll find out. Rams I'm just versus wait, Ravens. One thing. The reason why Shrikar is winning is because we haven't put the Bears games on the slates because they've been bad. I'm just he's kidding. Been, he's done well on Bears <laughs> I'm, kidding. We, uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding with I've, you. Actually, I've actually been pretty good on Bears picks. No, nah, you have been. You have been. You have been. Just because they've been so bad, it's so easy to pick against. Yeah, them, you just, you yeah, just pick kidding. them to lose. It's pretty Even easy. early in the season, yeah, I was pretty yeah. good with I'm them. kidding. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, because yeah, I think we both, Rams, we both Ravens. picked Chicago over Cincy. I remember that. So Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's Rams, go. Ravens. Oh, man. Matthew, Matthew Stafford, that guy could throw for 600 yards in this game, and I wouldn't be surprised one bit. I think Baltimore's only real hope in this game is, well, one, Lamar's got to play, and two, Lamar's got to go off. I don't see, you know, maybe one of those could happen, but I'm going to say the Rams win this game. Yeah, he's going to throw for 600 yards and like three picks, though, the, Matthew <laughs> Stafford. Uh, <laughs> no, I just think this is the perfect, like, recipe for the Rams right now. Like, if, if this was a healthy Ravens squad, uh, healthy secondary, healthy Lamar, it's, it's a much easier pick, and I think I'd go with the Ravens. Uh, but just right now, you can't pick them. The secondary is too depleted. They're facing Cooper Cup, Van Jefferson, and Odell Beckham Jr., so it's like, you just cannot pick the Ravens in this one. Uh, I think it's just a, a really fortunate matchup for the Rams. Okay. Am I the only one that thinks this? I think this is the easiest game that could be an upset. I think this is like, wow. Like, I'm not even like, I'm very, if I'm the Rams, I'm very, or like, if I'm a Rams fan, I'm very nervous about this game. I, I'm not even kidding. Like, what I are think you this nervous is about? Ultimate... Okay. Well, okay. Hold on. I think this is the ultimate trap game. Like I, I honestly do because look, Lamar comes back right after what I think three weeks right or three. Well, or he weeks? didn't. He didn't practice. Two and a half. Today, two and so a half. Who knows? He's he's two and a half. So back. he's coming back right and maybe we yes, don't know. I mean, he didn't practice today. Sugar said. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't practice. Yeah. I or yeah, if he does, I don't know. But like, if he does play, I'm very scared. If I'm the like, I, I feel like again, I just don't like when teams are riding a little bit high, and I again, they have to travel cross country to a team that is still kind of desperate and they still have a chance. The Ravens still have a legit chance at winning this. Uh, They're not riding division. high. And that's also the thing. Like, they, they just they squeak by against Minnesota. Huh? Mm. Oh yeah. That's one. Well, they, they barely squeak by and now they have to go again cross country. I'm, I'm honestly, I'm scared if I'm the Rams, I think this is the ultimate trap game. That being said, I feel like they'll still eke it out, but I feel like this is going to be a lot closer again than people think. Wow. Um, okay. I, I can see it, uh, but I just think, and I would not be shocked at all. I would, I would literally like, if I was a betting man, I would probably be at the Ravens plus whatever they're getting. I yeah, I want to say it's not, I would six points. If it's oh oh, it I'm is. hammering that. I would hammer. Rams are laying three and a half. Six. Oh, three and a half. Okay, why did oh, I think then, it was no. six? If it was, I, if it was, it was a plus six, with, I'm probably. I'm putting I'm putting a lot on that, and wow. I could probably be wrong, but no, I'm I'm serious. I think this is the ultimate trap. I'm really nervous. Confidence in the AFC North rivals. I see uh, an AFC matchup that. I think it, it's a really interesting one that I think we can talk a little bit about. Uh, we got to hurry up, though, is Dolphins versus Titans. Uh, Shrieker, you want to start us on that one? Dolphins have won seven straight, but in that span, they've beaten some pretty, pretty darn bad teams. <sighs> you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick Miami. It's just my gut decision. I know the Titans have extra rest. I know this goes against, you know, my pick morals. <sighs> I just have a gut feeling that the Dolphins are going to win this game. I don't know why, but I'm just going to go with them. Yeah, I'm really confident, actually. I'm going with the Titans in this one. I just think they, they match up very well against the Dolphins. The Dolphins, you're right, have not faced many tests uh, over their seven-game win streak. Uh, and I think the Titans match up well. And plus, it's, it's Ryan Tannehill's chance at a revenge game against Miami. So it's like... I'm going with the Titans. They've got more to play for. I think uh, you got to secure the division still playing for the one seed too. Uh, I think this is probably the nail in the coffin for the Dolphins playoff chances too. I think this is the hardest game to pick. Um, yeah. And also it's so ironic. You guys know, I love Rand Tanhill and it would be so funny for him to knock the Dolphins out of the playoffs. I, I feel like that would just be so funny because it would be the first playoff where they would get since Tannehill left. Um, but oh, man, this is tough because I feel like the Finns are hearing all the noise. I think flip a coin. I, I would I would pick Tennessee. I, I think they have a little bit more to play for for the one seed. So yeah, I'm gonna go with Tennessee. But I think Miami's hearing all of us talk, and I think they're thinking to themselves, "We got this." We'll see. I don't know how much I trust their offense against the Titans' defense. So I, I think there's the battle of the offenses. I trust t- uh, Tennessee way, way, way more. And I don't really understand what you're saying about Tua being you know good. I, I don't think he's it's efficient. I feel like he's got potential. I think he's still, 
Like he's improving. He's shown in the last, like he, again, he's leading in completion percentage. So it's not like this guy's a scrub, right? And yeah. I know he doesn't throw, you know, down the field enough, but I think he's got potential. Like I, I just, I, I don't know. I feel like you can, we've seen it twice, two years in a row now. You can win games with him. So yeah. Yeah. Well, so yeah. He plays a very conservative game. game though. That's why. If it works, it works. Win. I, if it works, it works. They've built a pretty good team around him. Yeah, that's true. I, I would give you that. Uh, this game would not have made it onto our slate uh, if we didn't have some interesting COVID-19 news. Uh, but we've got the Raiders and the Colts, who are most likely, as of right now, going to start Sam Ellinger. I'm sticking with the Colts anyway. I mean, I trust their offense. I think they're going to be able to run the ball on the Raiders. Uh, but you could see the same matchup that you kind of had with the Raiders and the Browns, uh, where they stack the box. Or no, no sorry, the Raiders and the, uh, the Broncos. They stacked the box, held them to under two yards of carry made Drew Locke win them the game, and it just didn't happen. Uh, but I think I trust the Colts' offensive line, trust Jonathan Taylor a little bit more than I trust the run, uh, the rushing attack of the, uh, the the Broncos. So I'm going with the Colts in this one still, with the possibility to get Wentz back, which I think would make it a no-brainer Colts decision. Raiders run the table. They make the playoffs. But I think the Colts are the better team. They're at home. They're still playing for the division. So I got to go with the Colts here. Uh, I think as of right now, I, I just want to see how long it takes, but I feel like we do have contingency on this, right? Yeah, so, we do. Like I'll take the, I'm actually going to take the Raiders for now. It's been so fortunate with literally three teams without their starting QB. And literally right as this helmet came in the mail, I literally woke, I opened this and I checked my phone and Wentz has COVID. I was so mad. I was so pissed. Um, but you know, I'm praying that he comes back. Obviously I'm hoping you guys are too. Uh, you know, as much as all my friends clown on him, never want to see a guy, you know, get sick, especially because he's unvaxxed. But um, yeah, I think uh, if he plays no brainer, I'm going with number two. Uh, but if he doesn't, honestly, I think the Raiders can, you know, I feel like they could, they're running the same game plan they've done all week, right? Again, like you said, they tried to make Drew Luck win them a game. And honestly, he put him in position. He had four drops, but yeah, I'm going to go with the Raiders for now. But if Wentz plays, which is leaning like that, I'm going to switch to the Colts. Uh, second to last game that we got the two biggest matchups of the week coming up, but it's chiefs versus Bengals. Uh, absolutely mammoth, uh, AFC matchup. It's such a big game. It's tough to pick and I'm not going first. How about, uh, Shigar, you start us off. Chiefs are going for nine straight, man. And look, the Bengals are a very, very tough matchup, but here's what I think it comes down to. It comes down to Kansas city's defensive front against Cincinnati's offensive line in which case I think it's lopsided in the Chiefs' favor. So I'm going to go with Kansas City to win this game. I'm so mad. Just because trends like this, when you say, oh, they've won seven straight, oh, they won eight straight, look what happens. And you know who I have to root for in this game. I'm not going to say it out loud, but um, I'm, I'm also going to pick the Chiefs. I just feel like these type of games, right, like even with the Cowboys, remember it was like clash of big, big matchups, right? Like Shrigar mentioned, I just feel like it's going to be a low-scoring game. I don't know why. And it, you wouldn't think that, right, with these two high-powered offenses. But I just feel like, you know, again, as Shrigar mentioned, I feel like it's going to come down to, you know, the two fronts. I really like what he said there. And, you know, again, I'm hoping the Chiefs can pull it out. Uh, and I, as much as I love Joe Burrow, right, I feel like Patrick Mahomes, this is kind of a game where the Chiefs say, hey, we're still the big brother in the AFC. Uh, and you guys are catching up, but not right now. So moving on to Jack. Yeah, if the Chiefs win out, they get the one seed. Uh, this does not feel like a game Patrick Mahomes is going to lose. Like, this this feels like one of the ones he's going to tell little Joe Burrow, like, this is still my league. Like, I'm still the best quarterback in the NFL. Uh, you know, this is my one seed team. Uh, I think that is actually a pretty good matchup for the Bengals. Um, but at the same time, you just cannot pick against the Chiefs right now. And they've been absolutely on fire. Uh, and ever since we kind of had those takeaways saying the Chiefs are – maybe falling down nope. a rabbit hole. You guys want to go down. Doubt them. They were like, uh, uh-uh, no, we are still the best team in the AFC. Uh, and they've played like it. Uh, and I think the offense is going to start to get clicking a little bit more. What they did to the Steelers was, was filthy. So I, I think they're, they're kind of building up a little bit. They really want to have that one seed, have a full week to get healthy, figure out their game plan and kind of figure out some of the, the, the ticks in their offense, uh, work them out. So I, I'm confident in the chiefs. And I just think at the moment, like as much as we want to praise Joe Burrow, praise the Bengals, you can't pick them in this one. Like, I, I don't think you really can. Um, same thing. I, I'll, I'll segue right into the Cardinals and Cowboys. I don't think you can pick the Cardinals over the Cowboys right now. And the Cowboys have been almost as on fire as the Chiefs. They're one big loss, you know, coming to Kansas City. The Cardinals, though, they've been on, on, a, on a tough stretch. They got, they got to go into Dallas, which I know they've been better on the road, but I don't really think that there's, like, an actual reason for that. Uh, so I, I'm going with the Cowboys in this one. Um, 
while I do think it's a good matchup for the Cardinals as well, without D-Hop, I don't think they'll be able to take advantage of the man-to-man defense that the Cowboys play as much as I think they would have uh, you know, the rest of the season with him healthy. Huge game in the, uh, in the NFC, not the AFC. I think the Cowboys are going to keep rolling. I mean, their defensive line you know, should win that battle against Arizona's O-line. Um, I, I just think they're going to win in the trenches, and ultimately Dak will have you know, a pretty good day. Yeah, I just can't pick against the Cowboys right now, especially at Jerry World. I think they're going to win. Again, I think this is like the Rams-Ravens. I think this is the ultimate trap game. I'm not even kidding. Like, I, I think, look, because the Cowboys, remember when they 43 dog the Atlanta Falcons, right? They dominate, and then they look like absolute crap the next week against, uh, I think it was Kansas City. So, or Denver, I forget. Denver. Um, but Denver. yeah, yeah. So, you know, they they look good and then they don't, right? So they're a bit inconsistent. And I, I feel like, you know, this is a perfect time for the Cardinals to say, hey, let's really saddle up and let's get back on it because I mean, lost three straight and they, they're trying to kind of hobble in. But, uh, and also they did embarrass them at Jerry World uh, last year on Monday Night Football. So, you know, it's not like they can't and they didn't have D-Hop that game either. So mm-hmm. um, I, it's tough. I, again, I think Dallas wins close. Um, but again, I, <laughs> I just don't think I just don't think you can really say that you know like that the Arizona Cardinals should be counted out. I and I, it's so tough. If they had D Hop, I would pick Arizona. I, yeah, I, gonna, I would too. Yeah, but I love uh, how you say ultimate trap game and then proceed to pick the other. I just because I I just don't <laughs> think it's people are saying like you know oh. Arizona sliding, Dallas is rising. Let's just go with Dallas. I, I don't yeah. think it's going to be like that. I, it's I, never like that in the NFL, and so yeah, we're picking exactly. week to week. Uh, a lot of games this week, and then next week. Hopefully it's a little close. Hopefully Sugar hasn't basically clinched by then. We can get some upsets uh, this week. But that's all we have for this week's episode. Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, We hope you enjoyed. If you're on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please consider rating the show five stars, following, you know, know, all that jazz. And then go to our Instagram and you can vote on uh, all of the games we've talked about this week and more uh, because you guys have a shot. You're in second place right now. And so don't count yourself out go pick those games on our instagram but anyways that's all we got for you guys today we've been the color truth podcast and we will see you next time